Unnatural, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, it's really unnatural uh, how uh, little uh, uh, in interest it's getting. And of course, uh, we have COVID crisis and we have lots of other things a little bit uh, drowning out this event. But Brexit as such is a, is a, is a tectonic event. It's, it's a huge event in, in the life of Europe. Uh, and uh, and therefore uh, it's good and, and thank you very much for the um, uh, BCC and SCC for organizing this so that we can uh, get experts and, and listen to them uh, about uh, how we should interpret this and what are uh, the threats and I know there will be also discussion about opportunities uh, related to, to Brexit. So. Uh, today, uh, we will have uh, three uh, excellent speakers, uh, and in the order of appearance, uh, they will be uh, Mr. Matas Maldekis, is a member of the Lithuanian Parliament, and uh, he has been acting as a permanent representative of the Lithuanian Parliament in the European Union, and advisor of the Committee of the European Affairs. Uh, 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 next speaker will be Mr. Peter Sandberg. He's a managing director of the Swedish Chamber of Commerce for the UK. And he has, uh, before joining the, the, the chamber, he has been working with the British Private Equity and Venture Capital Association and the Swedish American uh, Chamber of Commerce in New York. Uh, the third speaker is uh, Mr. Eikentas Vedritskas. He is a group CFO at uh, Transportation and Logistical, Logistics Services Company Integre Trans. Uh, operating all over Europe. Uh, so uh, a couple of housekeeping remarks. Uh, please, if you are not a speaker, uh, please uh, hide your, your uh, uh, video for now so that we can see the speakers and panelists. And speakers, please stay on, even if you're not speaking. And when you're not speaking, please keep your microphone on mute. And uh, please don't get insulted if uh, the organizers will mute you in, in case you forget. So uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, invite Mr. Maldekis to start uh, about uh, his perspective from the political side. Uh, what does Brexit mean for the EU27 and for the European business? Uh, Matas, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Vilus. I hope you hear me, ladies and gentlemen. Before the Brexit referendum, I heard three arguments for leave. We will fish as much as we want, healthcare will be cheaper and trade will grow. Now, uh, what I hear after the Brexit, the EU is overfishing and we are sort of fish. We have raised healthcare prices and United States is threatening us, but not the EU with tariffs. The only significant achievement of British is the taxation of work visas for immigrants from Lithuania and a couple other countries. I wish the British to accumulate wealth from visas of my compatriots because so far the beginning is not very optimistic. Half of the United Kingdom's trade portfolio today, today is in uh, European Union. In perfect condition, it takes European Union over decades to negotiate a trade deal with countries they like. Added some Brexit-related bad blood, never far below the surface geopolitical competition with the French, the Dutch insistence that everyone who gain access to EU market also follow EU rules in full, uh, Irish Persian for knife twisting, Germany's ironclad demand that EU pay Europe in cash for EU market access, that Spain's never ending bitching about Gibraltar, Gibraltar and the speed of a trade agreement that come to power in the beginning of this year is astonishing. The speed shows that both sides need each other. Now United Kingdom formally become the third, uh, third country for the EU. But it's obvious that United Kingdom is very special third country and it's imported similar to, and it's imported similar to the United States. It is, in interest, uh, it is in interest of the whole European Union that partnership and cooperation with the EU on foreign policy, security, defense is strong and more ambitious than with other third countries. Cooperation with the United Kingdom in NATO forum needs to be strategic security. United Kingdom will remain an important partner in tackling global challenges such as climate change, pandemic violations of international law. 
that we see in a few, few days ago. United Kingdom will continue to play an important role in helping us counter the destructive act of Russia and China in the increase and resilience of our Eastern partners. For Lithuania, United Kingdom is one of our closest strategic, strategic partners. United Kingdom contribution Regionally, we will seek to maintain this important relationship by implementing an ongoing and planned defense-related activities with involvement of our British partners. United Kingdom is the second biggest Lithuanian export market outside the United uh, European Union. Even after the Brexit, Lithuanian companies demonstrate strong will willingness to continue trade with the United Kingdom. Despite many unknowns and uncertainties, uh, exports of Lithuanian origin goods to United Kingdom increased by 31% in January uh, this year as compared to January 2020. The current agreement with tariff-free and quota-free trade in goods and facilitated customs procedures provide only a limited solution. The customs and burden of non-tariff barriers is more expensive uh, than tariffs themselves. Therefore, stronger EU-United Kingdom cooperation on non-tariff issues and standards should be a way to facilitate our bilateral trade. Uh, trade in high added value goods and investment promotion, our key priorities uh, when we look uh, to our United Kingdom partners from Lithuanian perspective. We would be interested in exploring possibilities for joint research and development initiative and production capabilities of vaccine. Lithuania can offer to the British partners an excellent research and development infrastructure in highly capable academic talent pools. Cooperation in life science is, only, uh, is also a great mutual interest. Life Science Baltics is the only international forum in the Baltics for the world-class biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, and medical device experts. Next Life uh, Science Baltics is scheduled for September this year, and I would like to use this opportunity to invite representative of the UK public and private sector to, to seize this opportunity to exchange ideas and explore new partnership in this field. We see potentially financial services as well as certain manufacturing sector, automobile components, aviation, engineering, life science, uh, video games, and other high tech sectors related to robotization, automatization, and digitalization. Uh, last year, as you may know, Lithuania adopted legislative package, so-called Green Corridor Bill to create even better investment, cli investment climate that is favorable favorable for attracting and expanding sustainable and large-scale investment in Lithuania. This package offers a number of significant tax incentives. United Kingdom companies, especially those exploring the Nordic Baltic countries and Poland, should, uh, should set up branches in Lithuania responsible for custom clearance and contribution. But there is one sector I would like to increase, uh, emphasize, especially when talking about Brexit results, our fintech sector. We can already talk, draw a conclusion that this is the sector where Lithuania used Brexit in its full advantage. Trade deal between EU and UK was very limited provisions on financial services. Therefore, Lithuania used this opportunity in full. Having kickstarted its ambitious goal of becoming a high tech hub in Nordic and Baltic region and to become the gates to European uh, market, Lithuania has caught an attention of dozens of company, companies wishing to acquire financial institution licenses in this country. Fintech, uh, fintech companies from the United Kingdom alone were granted 17 operating licenses and there is two, already 230 fintech firms in total as this, two, this year and this number is growing. It seems that the global fintech sector has heard our message loud and clear. With Bank of Lithuania acting as an accessible regulator, maintaining an open attitude toward innovation and ensuring one of the fastest licensing regime in the EU, 
Lithuania is a perfect place to start and grow an international fintech business. As a result, the interest of both foreign and local companies have peaked. Close cooperation between public sector authorities responsible of the development of the domestic financial sector flexibility, as well as the country visibility in the global arena promoted by private partners uh, among the key factors behind Lithuania's success in this sector. Foreign companies are particularly interested in obtaining a specialized bank, electronic money or payment institution license that would grant the right to operate across the EU. It is especially true for company in post-Brexit United Kingdom, as some of United Kingdom base and, uh, and authorized businesses see Lithuania as a potential base uh, should they need to relocate their EU companies or operations. Companies reaching to the licenses, uh, licenses out to the Bank of Lithuania are from Latvia, Estonia, Poland, uh, United States, Canada, Australia, China, Israel, or Singapore. According to investors, there are the main four advantages Lithuania brings to the table. Relatively easy and low cost authorization process, very fast decision of, of licensing, access to the Bank of Lithuania payment infrastructure and highly qualified, uh, qualified talent pool. As you see, FinTech is the sector we saw opportunity after the Brexit and we grabbed it. Other promised areas we would like to leave our mark on in the future and a place for possible further cooperation of uh, life and health science, cybersecurity, 5G, artificial intelligence, climate change, renewable or renewable energy. Ladies and gentlemen, as famous TV series, Yes, Minister thought about the United Kingdom view on the EU is as I quote, we try to break it from the outside, but that wouldn't work. Now that we are inside, we can make a complete pig's breakfast out of the whole thing. Set the Germans against the French, French against the Italians, Italians against the Dutch, the foreign office is very pleased. It's just like old times. After the United Kingdom saw that this strategy doesn't work inside the United EU anymore and coping with guerrilla welfare, uh, welfare inside the conservative party themselves, we got Brexit process. Uh, by the way, United Kingdom was the biggest lobby of, of Lithuania membership in the EU and the uh, uh, free movement of Lithuanians in the EU because it thought that it would make the EU weaker. Brexit was a big challenge for all of us, politically, economically, commercially. This period was easier in the sense that United Kingdom never were never full member of, United, of the EU. But every challenge gives new opportunities. As would Winston Churchill would say, never waste a good crisis. And in our case, a br good Brexit away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matas. This uh, I'm uh, absolutely sure that the viewers will have questions. Um, <laughs> this was really I hope exciting so. and, and interesting. And by the way, I didn't mention that uh, after we have the three presentations, we will have uh, 20 minutes uh, plus or minus uh, for questions. So please, uh, those who are present, uh, uh, you have the privilege of being able to ask questions because people who watch us on social media, uh, it's more difficult for them, uh, I understand. So. Uh, now uh, we move to Peter Sandberg, and uh, Peter will uh, tell us how Swedish uh, businesses cope with the post-Brexit in the UK. Uh, Peter, thank you, Vilja, uh, and I'm going to share my screen. Good morning, everyone. Let me know if you can see this. Let me stop my camera so I don't break the bandwidth during my presentation. But um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm so happy to join you today from a sunny London. Not often you can say that, particularly in the last two months, let me tell you. Uh, and thanks to the Swedish and British Chambers of Commerce in Lithuania for inviting us along from London. Um, my name is uh, Peter Sandberg. Uh, what, three years now? So, I mean, my life has been Brexit nonstop. It's been fun. 
uh, it's a huge issue and concern uh, and naturally an, uh, of interest to businesses and entrepreneurs. And let me tell you, I do not know how many Brexit roundtables, forums, webinars uh, uh, we have hosted or participated in, but it's a lot to the extent where we've had to rename them, you know, the future relationship, the new relationship, <laughs> the ongoing relationship, et cetera, just to keep it fresh. But very quickly, um, you know, Swedish Chamber, so I don't need to do that, but um, on Christmas Day 2020, we have an agreement, finally, for getting there, actually. I mean, four and a half years, um, that was a very long period. But um, at the end, like we pointed out, a deal was better than no deal. Um, and my my invitation here today from you and I was to share the point of view from Swedish business. And that's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, the Chamber is an independent organization. Uh, it clearly took no side in the Brexit uh, referendum. I don't think you'd be surprised if we surveyed our businesses where they would stand on the remain or leave situation. Uh, but at the at the end, as as um, Matt has clearly pointed out, um, in the UK, you, you sort of want to stay away from that standpoint that this was a choice for the British people. Uh, and it's a very toxic uh, conversation to get into politically. Um, so I said um, four and a half years. So were businesses prepared? Well, this was the situation described by business organizations and service providers like law firms, et cetera, in the space in the autumn uh, of 2020, just to paint a bit of a picture. So 10% of British supply chain managers felt full control of a Brexit's impact on the supply and distribution chains. This is in September last year. 46% of small and medium-sized businesses say they've been so focused on COVID that they haven't had time to consider Brexit. This was in November last year. 14% of businesses exporting to the EU had actually consulted government advice online. So 86% had not looked at government recommendations online. 75% of large corporates in the UK are worried about customs capacity after Brexit. That was clearly so, and they were clearly right. The number of customs entries um, uh, were set to increase by 500% to 300 million per year from the 1st of January, 2021. Um, there was clearly outlined that there was a shortage of about 5,000 skilled customs agents. And we, as a chamber, have seen that in the last few months where Quite simply, a lot of our smaller businesses cannot get a customs agent because uh, demand is too high. Um, so going from that, so what's the impact of the um, actual deal? What, I mean, businesses, your businesses yourselves, you would have seen some of that. Much focus um, has always been on customs. Um, so um, the change uh, to importing and exporting, it's all very logical and easy to understand to some extent. So with the deal, we have no tariffs on customs, which is great. However, as, as Marta has clearly pointed out, there is no single market, which means that everything still needs to be declared, uh, which comes with a lot of cost, a lot of administration, which is clearly uh, becoming an issue for a lot of our members now. Uh, but a no deal exit here could have led to increasing costs for certain goods. Uh, I mean, being a, um, a Swedish Chamber of Commerce, cars were mentioned, where we could have had uh, tariffs of up to 30% on a Volvo car or a Volvo truck, which would have been detrimental to them. Uh, but fresh foods were mentioned as well. And I think that's one of those. It goes to the hearts of people when you stop their shellfish coming across the channel, which happened in Q1, let me tell you, and it was detrimental. Um, and let's remember that before um, the EU exit, at least 50% of Britain's trade was with the European Union. So 50% of everything coming across the borders now are delayed, essentially. Uh, we were slightly less prepared, I think, for the uh, end of freedom of movement of people. I think it was so much focus on customs and imports and tariffs, um, but Brexit also meant the end of freedom of movement of people. Uh, in fact, it was a major issue in the referendums. So it was quite symbolic. Uh, the law was introduced quite late and made it really hard for businesses to prepare. But also moving people has now become a lot trickier and costlier. So the visa processes limits uh, the freedoms to move staff and to hire and actually could cost thousands of pounds per staff member. And something that I'm subject to myself when I'm trying to get people across the border. Data and GDPR is still not really sorted, it's become an issue too. Um, but then looking at the positive side of it to some extent that beyond the 50% the UK traded with the EU, some 20% of its trade was actually covered by EU trade deals. 
uh, with third countries. Uh, and at the beginning of the year, the UK had successfully negotiated new deals with 63 out of the 70 countries. I have to give it to them. That, that was quite an achievement in those, those number of years, albeit mainly blanket deals. So they were basically copying the trade deals <laughs> that the EU already had in many cases. But lastly, VAT has arisen as one of those issues for businesses as well. So looking at some of the example of Swedish businesses, how they were hit, IKEA is a huge employer in the UK. They employ 11,000 people, I think, in the UK. Clearly, they, they, they got it all. Customs and paperwork, country of origin issues, marking the UK is leaving the CE, marking our products, um, uh, uh, which relates to the country of origin, et cetera. Logistics and lead times affected them. I know for a fact that IKEA uh, tried to import as much as possible in December. Uh, but then because of COVID, I mean, it was a farce. I don't know if you remember this, but France closed the borders to Britain because of COVID, which meant that the last <laughs> imports that they were trying to do in December before Brexit were held back. It was a farce. Handelsbanken is another one. They employed 2,500 people in the UK, I have 200 branches. They had to set up a completely new bank because they couldn't be a branch anymore. That was a huge task, which they managed to do before Brexit. Uh, and obviously were clearly uh, impacted. But then Swedish games developer King, if you've ever played Candy Crush, you'll know them. Um, for them, having two head offices in Stockholm and London, immigration issues is really what they're worried about. They can't move their people freely uh, between their offices as they have uh, in the past. Um, now looking, uh, onwards um, to the 1st of January, this is what we saw. And every discussion that we had at the Swedish Chamber and every interview that I gave to the press, it was, we are expecting delays and problems for the first six months. And that's pretty much exactly what happened. Delays, that's what we saw. Um, it didn't really arrive in the first week because of pre-importing um, in, in December and a lot of businesses tried to stay away for the first week thinking that was gonna be a disaster, which meant that week two and three were the disaster weeks because everyone sort of accumulated that uh, traffic there. So it was a bit of a mess. Come late February, we surveyed our members, uh, Swedish businesses, I should point out in the UK about their experience uh, uh, after Brexit. And this is what we got. So 73% of our businesses were affected by Brexit. So most of them, uh, those not affected were most likely B2B businesses who weren't moving goods at all uh, and didn't have any issues in the first quarter. Uh, one in four surveyed businesses felt unprepared. That's still shocking. I mean, they had four and a half years <laughs> and they had a Swedish Chamber of Commerce shooting information at them. They had uh, the Department for International Trade posting things in the underground sending them uh, violent text messages, I was gonna say, but that's not true. Um, but they still felt unprepared. Uh, and I showed you the stats before and much of it was true. Well, uh, although 30% felt well prepared, which is great. What's worse is two and a half percent saying they are not prepared at all. Um, and I should say as well, the Swedish businesses actually compared fairly well compared to UK businesses uh, when the CBI did their services. Um, two thirds uh, experience delays or problems, uh, not a, a surprising, um, as we said, to be expected. Um, and saying that, I mean, delivery times will inevitably take longer moving forward anyway. Uh, and diving into some of the delays or problems, I mean, logistics providers having to adapt. We know uh, Schenker and others refused to uh, 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 ship to the UK for a couple of weeks. Customs clearance um, were unprepared on either side. The Northern Ireland situation, I know, caused a lot of problems, not the least for IKEA. Uh, intermediaries not up to speed with UK customs systems, VAT, and much more. We asked them about primary blockers. So, what are the blockers to progress? Well, increase in paperwork, I think you mentioned, customs work. Um, longer delivery lead times. Um, and it's something you're going to have to prepare for. Um, but we also mentioned equivalence in services and financial services. I mean, the City of London is anxiously awaiting the next step in the trade deal, which will be instrumental. But then I think the last one is really interesting, which came from one of our biggest businesses. They said dealing with Brexit in lockdown when we actually can't uh, uh, take things to, uh, to an accelerated level. Looking forward, what are businesses saying? Um, well, there are mixed feelings on the wider uh, Brexit effect, but none are solely positive, which is indicative.
indicative. It's probably what the EU wanted at the end of the day as well. Uh, of course, it will have some negative uh, impact. Uh, but over a third are more optimistic about growth uh, on level terms with those less optimistic, so split. I mean, I still have some kind of COVID goggles when I read this as well. Are they optimistic because of lockdown so they're actually accelerating or is it because of brexit you can read that in any way you want i'm, I'm a bit cautious there uh, almost 50 percent of the swedish businesses survey were hiring new british staff which is a sign of confidence i think only 23 percent said no but they're hiring no one from sweden and that's the reality there's been a lot of movement of people to london which has been good for london it's been good for uh, for europe as well but that's sort of the situation now um, what caught us though um, is this, uh, in a positive way, 73% of respondents had an unchanged view uh, of the UK being important to their international strategy and their international expansion strategy. So the UK is still very much important to Swedish business. You mentioned in the Lithuanian context how important the UK is. Well, to a Swedish business growing outside of the Nordics, you either go to Germany or you go to the UK. You go there for very different reasons. Uh, the UK, you go uh, if you're a tech business or if you want to uh, internationalize globally. Uh, uh, so you go there for a very different thing, I think. Um, this one was quite interesting as well. When looking at, I, I'm not sure if you use snooze or snuff, but one of our members clearly said, we look forward to a new environment where the UK can actually introduce snooze. So we see this as a great opportunity. There is opportunities, right? Uh, with leaving the European Union as well. And I'm glad that they look at it that way. Um, to just finish off uh, uh, on a positive uh, note, this is why we help um, Swedish businesses um, go to the UK, because I feel like it's often so negative, so I'm going to take the right to do this, and the British Chamber will be very pleased. Um, but we always try to make the case for the UK. In fact, we're launching a campaign with the UK's Department for International Trade. Uh, in the summer aimed at Swedish businesses in Sweden. It's the fifth biggest economy, maybe the sixth now, maybe India has passed it now. So I'll let that sit there for a moment. Uh, we still argue that it's a number one financial center in the world and whatever happens, it will remain the, the financial center of Europe. Uh, it's one of Sweden's largest trading partners in Brexit year and actually dropped to eighth, but we're pretty sure it won't bounce back. And it's number one for unicorns. And for any Swede, unicorns is how we measure success for some odd reason. That's the only measurable success we have. Um, ranking of universities, if you have anything uh, um, R&D related, if you have anything to do with tech, there's more software developers in London than there are people in Sweden's third biggest city. And that puts it into context. London is still the very much the global hub um, of Europe, if not the world. I, I was I'm amazed at how 57% of Fortune 500 European headquarters are based in the UK. Germany ranks second with 14%. The American factor plays uh, uh, an instrumental part. It's a good place to do business. And uh, jokingly put the first one there. Historically, there's been politically and economically stable. And the last five years have been nothing like that. Well, actually, the last 10 years, but before that good legal system, pro-business regulation, easy to set up business. This is quite easy to sell to Swedish businesses. And then from the unicorn point of view, which matters to a Swede, Sweden is, uh, I think, has the highest number of unicorns per capita, but the UK actually has more unicorns than Germany, Sweden, and the Netherlands together. Thank you. <laughs> I had to make that case, sorry. Peter, thank you very much. This is really uh, interesting. And, uh, and of course, uh, when you have numbers and data, uh, the talk is always more serious. So, so thanks a lot for that. And, uh, and uh, you've moved uh, a little bit towards the optimistic at the end. And I think that's really handy because uh, Agentas uh, has a positive story of uh, opportunities from Brexit. Agentas, please, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you. So, Peter, also thank you for very interesting statistics uh, and also enlightening. Um, I didn't know that you guys were second in the world in Nobel Prize uh, winners. Uh, so that's uh, congratulations. Not that far from the first place, I guess. So my name is Egan Tuss and, um, and I'm Chief Financial Officer for Integra Trans Group. Um, it's an honor for me to be here and uh, I'm thankful to the organizers. I was asked uh, to say a few words about, uh, about our company, Integra Trans, and what we do. And of course, uh, 
our relationship uh, to the UK market uh, prior and uh, post Brexit. So before I continue with that, uh, for those of you who might not know, I would like to say a few words about uh, Integra Trans as a company and what we do in general. So we are a ground transportation services company. So we have uh, lots of trucks and uh, we use roads to carry goods uh, all across Europe. Uh, historically, our two largest markets were France and Germany. Uh, I would say close to 90% of our sales came from those two markets. But uh, recently in the last uh, few years, we have been expanding our geographical diversification into, into other large European markets such as uh, uh, Spain and Italy and, 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 and some others. And of course, uh, recently we found ourselves working with the UK as well. Um, we use uh, we use tented semi trailers, and we work with uh, clients from all the different industries, uh, from food to construction materials, and all the way to uh, different uh, chemical industry type of um, of goods that we carry. So, so it's pretty wide uh, from that perspective. Now, one one of the one of the factors, the distinguishing factors about Integra Trans is our, I would say, very rapid growth. Just to put it a little bit into perspective, uh, we've grown, we we've tripled our sales in the last four years as we are approaching 100 million euro in annual turnover. And we've grown our fleet from about 10 trucks to close to 600 trucks in the last four years as well. So how did we get ourselves into the UK market? Well, um, given all this rapid expansion, it has been instrumental for us to, to look and search and, and, and find new markets uh, where we could uh, execute this growth. Uh, limiting ourselves to Germany and France uh, was never going to be easy if we had uh, these kind of growth targets. That's why we started looking into different countries and different markets. And so, and so the UK market has been on our radars for quite some time, but uh, we found ourselves uh, all the time as having uh, some, some other better things to do than, uh, than uh, uh, then force ourselves to enter this market because we knew that it was not going to be an easy market. It, 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 it's a different market, especially from transportation point of view. But then, uh, then uh, as uh, as uh, as uh, year 2020 was uh, was unfolding and Brexit was approaching, uh, uh, standing on the sidelines and uh, and observing the situation, we started noticing that. Uh, uh, the shortage of trucks going from the continental Europe to the UK um, was was increasing as uh, as the new year was uh, was approaching, and uh, eventually in uh, in November and especially in December, uh, some of our largest clients from Germany and France. Uh, found themselves uh, in a very uncomfortable position as uh, their suppliers who they relied on uh, to, 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 to export goods from continental Europe to the UK, all of a sudden they were, they were, they were leaving the clients and saying that uh, we are exiting the UK market. It's going to be too complicated and too complex and there is too much turmoil. Um, to continue carrying goods to, to, to the UK. So our major clients all of a sudden with the Christmas season approaching um, had to do something. They needed to find new partners who would, uh, who would be able to provide them with these uh, services. So they approached us and they offered us an opportunity to, um, uh, to enter the UK market perhaps uh, soon sooner than we would have otherwise done uh, had it not been uh, for, 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 for the upcoming uh, Brexit deadlines. And, um, and we chose to do it. Uh, we, we knew that, uh, that uh, it was going to be a, a difficult move. Uh, firstly, because uh, uh, there are challenges with the UK market uh, 
uh, that are not related to Brexit, speaking from transportation services perspective. So we knew we had to deal with those. And we knew that in about one month's time, a Brexit will, uh, will, will, will be enforced, so to speak, and, uh, and, uh, and God knows what will happen then. But uh, we, we chose to do that and we chose to, to, to help our clients when they needed us the most. And all of a sudden we found ourselves um, traveling back and forth, running, uh, running our trucks from continental Europe to the UK and, uh, and back to, to, to the continental Europe. Um, so we are happy we did that, uh, looking, look, look, looking backwards, but but uh, it, it was not easy. It was very difficult and there were many challenges. As I said, uh, uh, there were certain challenges. Uh, I, I, I could name a few. They are somewhat specific to transportation services, but uh, uh, challenges that were not related to, to, to Brexit. Well, first of all, due to all the uh, different rules that you have uh, in, in running uh, transportation industry in the UK, mainly uh, driving on the opposite side of the road, uh, we had to rearrange uh, all of our drivers and make sure that, uh, and we have like 700 of them, just to put it in, in perspective. We had to make sure that only the best and, uh, and, and the most skilled uh, and the ones with uh, highest competence uh, drivers would actually be doing this job. That was necessary to make sure that our uh, accident uh, level doesn't increase and our insurance costs uh, don't uh, skyrocket because of that. So, so that was the first thing that had to be done, rearranging of, of drivers. The second big thing, due to all the time zone differences, we had to rearrange our staff in the office and uh, create new shifts and hire some new some new staff uh, employees uh, who could do the job. Um, we also found ourselves having to pay significantly high insurance premium, as apparently uh, running trucks uh, in continental Europe, but also adding UK as destination increases your insurance premium significantly. So that had to take to, to be taken into consideration. Um, and then also, since, since we employ for the most part uh, drivers from Belarus, um, they needed UK visas. And, uh, and, uh, and that process of how to acquire these visas uh, had, to be, had to be learned quickly and on the spot. And uh, it does take time and it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not that smooth when it comes to uh, to, to, to getting UK visas for Belarus, Belarusian citizens. So, you know, just to mention a few of the challenges that, uh, that had to be overcome uh, in, in, in a really quick manner as, as our clients were somewhat desperate uh, for us to start running to the UK, we had to do that. Uh, once we did that, we were happy because December was really good uh, because, uh, because there was lots of imports going uh, towards the UK and there was a shortage of trucks. So financially speaking, it was a really good, uh, good month uh, from that perspective. But then the Brexit hit and, uh, and uh, everything stayed the same except uh, for one thing, I would say, and it's customs. It's something that uh, that was that became a really big challenge. It it, it became really difficult to um, uh, to to anticipate and to plan uh, the timing of trucks and how long you will have to stay in queues uh, both for import and and for export. Uh, so so customs is the main thing that still remains. Um, I would say the biggest challenge since all the other ones we kind of have overcome and we learned the, the rules of a game, but customs uh, is still something that, um, that, uh, that, um, uh, that, that could improve, I guess, and, um, and, and help us. Um, but there were benefits to all of this. And, uh, and as I said, uh, it, it was never easy, but we are very happy we did it. At the end of the day, we are counting now that we've been in the UK market for some six months. Um, we, we increased and improved our geographical diversification away from Germany, from France, uh, uh, 
uh, and, uh, and and we believe that the UK market could become a significant market in our in our in our geographical diversification. Uh, so we see a big positive in that. We were able to strengthen the relationships with our existing clients as we held them when they most needed us. In addition to that, we were, of course, able to find um, new customers uh, who reside in the UK and, uh, and, and we started relationships with them. Um, and of course, we found the uh, new streams uh, for sales and for profits. Uh, so it's always, it's always good uh, speaking from a business perspective. So I guess just to summarize a little bit in a few sentences of, uh, of, um, of, of my, my whole message. Uh, so first of all, I would like to say is that, you know, it's impossible to be 100% ready for something. Uh, and it might be too expensive uh, to be 100% ready for something. You, you have to make calculated risks. You have to have a mindset of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, having to learn on the spot and do it quickly. Uh, and you have to jump into it. So, you know, that, that's what we did. We were never ready 100% to, to enter this market. It was never going to be easy, but, but we did it. We, we, we have tremendous people in our organization who, who had good mindset and, uh, and with whose abilities and, uh, and, and help we were able to overcome these issues. And, uh, and now we are happy being in the UK market. And in fact, we actually see ourselves growing our business portfolio in the UK market. Uh, uh, and by the end of the year, we would like to have a uh, double of uh, sales from what we have uh, today. So, so we really uh, expect good things from this market and we are glad we, we found it. So shortly, shortly, that's it for me. Thank you very much, uh, Egentas. Thank you very much. And it's a really interesting and uh, specific perspective. So now we have a time for questions. And uh, since we are here on the Zoom, uh, we are a compact group. So uh, if someone would like to ask a question, please open your microphone, open your camera and shoot. If not, I have some questions prepared. So maybe I can just reflect uh, uh, the image I received uh, after Peter's presentation and with Agentast uh, explaining, you know, how they entered the UK market. So were your trucks on Peter's picture? <laughs> Did uh. you experience a similar situation? And were you part of what Peter just demonstrated? It's just sort of a side the truck comment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, some of those trucks, I believe, are from our company. <laughs> Yes, that, well, that's a great question because uh, it, it makes the picture alive. Uh, any, anyone would like to ask a question? Okay, well, uh, uh, let me then start maybe with questions and, and uh, may, uh, maybe the viewers will catch up, although we don't have too much time, so, so uh, be quick with catching up. But. Uh, so, uh, and, and thanks a lot for the speakers who gave a positive uh, also spin to this. And of course, uh, being uh, here in Lithuania, we are extremely pro-European, uh, of course. And uh, so with us, uh, all the jokes, the negative jokes about breakfast go very well. Uh, and all the bad news about, bre about Brexit go very well. But on the other hand, uh, even with this positive uh, information. The picture I get, and maybe I, I think um, uh, maybe uh, all speakers could could uh, touch on this. The picture I get is that uh, while it's a disruption, and the positive news are when we could mitigate the consequences of this disruption, or we could go around this disruption, or we could use overreaction of others to this disruption. But Brexit in itself, what is the positive effect that we could wait from it? Or what is the opportunity part uh, in the long run, except for, OK, well, it's a disruption. The lines are longer, but we can survive. Uh, that's, that's very nice. But uh, in the long run, this, uh, the long lines mean loss of business. 
uh, uh, I don't know, Peter, you are you are in there, uh, so you That's, have. It's maybe, a very good what, question what, because uh, I think uh, you know, in, in an attempt to really try to focus on what is the opportunity here, and and one of the things that I see as an opportunity is how. You know, the UK is coming out of the European Union. There is some kind of momentum. There's a, a desperate need. We can mention the Conservatives as much as we want here, but, you know, they're going to have to prove a point. They're going to have to prove a point that the UK can make it outside of the European Union. They want to invest in a UK going forward. And what I can see as something positive here is that the fact that the UK will have to invest. So they will be investing in the UK when it comes to artificial intelligence and infrastructure and stuff. And you know, as a positive spin on the EU, that means that the EU has a neighbor that they they will need to level up with, they will need to compete, because let's face it, Europe is falling behind China and the US when it comes to tech uh, and tech advancements and stuff. I'm not saying there's a negative in there, but the, you know, there's regulation in Europe and you need to find some kind of way of spinning it so that you don't fall hopelessly behind. I think the UK can sort of be the spearhead. And let's face it, France and Germany is not going to want to fall behind the UK. And it's going to be way more personal than falling behind the US. I hope, I hope that's going to push, push us into a, a good direction. And that's my positive spin on it. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Matas. Uh, the same as Peter mentioned, that the United Kings will have to come up with, uh, uh, invest more and do more. The same with the European Union. This is, we will look at the United Kingdom investing more and we will have to invest even more because we want to show the United Kingdom that, you know, you, you are the losers in the story because uh, in the end of the day, what is the Brexit is all about? Why the Brexit was such a long, such was. It was about the capitals uh, when all the leaders that was uh, meeting in Brussels and all the delegation that was meeting in Brussels uh, from the Brexit, they wanted just one thing. They wanted to make the British uh, uh, at, at least look that they are doing bad to, to come to their capitals and say, look, look what would happen, happen if, if, if Brexit would, if exit would happen in our countries, you know. They would have to make it a leverage against the British and against their Eurosceptic parties. So in the long run, United Kingdom will be, I'm sure, a very successful story. But in the sense that will help European Union to grab their uh, mojo, their ego, and come up with some new, you know, going forward with European project in, as it is. Uh, thank you, Matas. Uh, Eginte, would you like to add something? Uh, yes, I could add maybe a note or two. As, um, as Matt has mentioned uh, and, and cited Winston Churchill about, uh, about not missing any uh, good crisis, uh, you know, looking from a business perspective, when, when everything is clear and, with, when, and when the dust settles, that's when the profit, profit margins fall. And, then every, and, and the reason they fall is because everybody can do that everybody and everybody jumps in and and that pushes down the profit margins in our case you know we we like to take on risk and we feel that internally we do have competence and willingness to to go the extra mile to solve those difficult questions and as a result be rewarded with a somewhat higher margin that 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 we could earn on the other hand in some maybe you know um other territories like Germany or France, for, for, for that matter. So, um, you know, currently the situation is a, as it is. We expect that uh, this, uh, this, this, this turmoil and, and these processes and, uh, um, you know, before they become completely clear and predictable, it will take some time. And we are okay with that because that's where we see our opportunities to to to, to make some money in in in, in that uh, situation. Um, so we think that at least 2021 and perhaps 2022 will be will be the years when uh, when uh, European carriers will still be 
uh, to some extent uh, avoiding and maybe even using that word afraid of a UK market be because of all this uh, you know legal le legal difficulties associated with it so um, yeah, but uh, but I agree with Matas. Uh, you know, as, as he said, uh, in, in in the long or medium term, uh, I mean, UK is a great country. Let's be honest. Uh, you know, tons of people, uh, huge diversification, uh, and and in Peter's slide, all these fantastic numbers. I mean, it's it's a great country. We're just uh, you know with great potential. So we are talking about the the certain difficulties that arise between the UK and the and, and between continental Europe from the legal standpoint. But uh, when talking about whether or not uh, uh, UK as a country has a huge potential to you know lead the band, so to speak, in fintech and 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 and, and all of the things, you know that's that's clear. So, but but we but we hope that this storm will last for for at least a little bit longer, so that we can uh, we can expand our footprint in, in this market for a bit longer. So there's a clear practical suggestion for Lithuanian businesses. Like look, uh, now the risk is higher because uh, uh, because some businesses are being cautious. So the, so there's an opening uh, to enter now in the short uh, term. Uh, great, thanks, uh, Egented. Uh, anyone would like to ask a question from the audience? Uh, not yet. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I'd well, like to ask a question. Yeah, please, Tommy. Yes. I represent Green Carrier, a Swedish company. Uh, we also have offices in UK. So, obviously, we had kind of, you know, first hand experience here as well. Uh, I like Peter's presentation, and I have a question to Peter. Uh, we are now five months in. Uh, what is the data showing now? What's the feedback for the business environment um, in UK? Have they got a grip? Uh, what's your knowledge or feeling about it? Well, I think uh, as we predicted, things have you know you don't see any dramatic images from uh, from uh, Dover or the ports anymore. I think they're catching up, but it's also a matter of the businesses catching up with uh, not expecting things to be delivered within the same uh, time frame. Um, um, things are, are uh, getting better, um, but, but but it's not necessarily going back to what it was. I don't think it ever will. Uh, it's about adapting. We still have a number of Swedish businesses, smaller businesses um, uh, that have halted uh, their um, exports to the UK, for example, because they still haven't sorted out the best way of, of uh, importing goods uh, into the UK. Um, I think that's all going to be taken care of within these 12 months. We are going to survey our members in September and see how they feel then compared to in February and I think that the, the situation will be very different but as always I think it's really hard to measure like Brexit impact now and that Boris Johnson's government is very lucky about COVID because what is COVID related and what is Brexit related I have a feeling in the UK so the UK economy dipped 10% last year uh, second worst in Europe don't tell me that was all COVID related because it was not uh, there's a, a clear Brexit impact uh, uh, in that, and there's going to be for the next couple of years. But like I said, I'm still quite confident. And I was very pleased to see that Swedish businesses were so confident because uh, we can make that case. Yes, the UK, like I said, there's going to be uh, opportunities here as well. But I think for a Swedish business, the UK is a necessity. Um, we have a thousand Swedish businesses in the UK, uh, and some of them have been here for 115 years. Uh, you know, that's integral. There's 100,000 employees of Swedish businesses in the UK. It's such an instrumental part of like your internationalization process. So the issue is rather, what are you going to do on the UK market compared to what you did before? What kind of uh, manufacturing are you going to do? At, um, and what are you better doing somewhere else? Uh, and the whole tariff thing, which we don't talk so much about, but, but I mean, that opened up for some of our large manufacturing businesses to actually remain on the market. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Thomas, for the question. Uh, um, so we have time for one more question, I hope. We, we started a bit late, so. Uh, okay, well, uh, yeah, so maybe uh, then last question to all. Uh, to all, all I think, uh, well, still, 
there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I think, uh, well, the, despite that there is good news, and of course we are, we have high expectations from the United Kingdom because it's a great country and no doubt, uh, although I have my own doubts about, uh, well, if, if it would have had the same number of unicorns, for example, outside the EU, uh, because the unicorn age was when the Britain was inside the EU. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we're about to see that. Maybe they'll have more. Uh, but uh, still, so if you would think um, uh, that the business, uh, the people here, uh, either in the meeting or, or listening to us on the social media, should uh, think about or should, should, uh, um, uh, should uh, t take away from this discussion, what would that be? What would be your conclusion on, on what to expect from Brexit? Um, Mate, maybe you would like to start. Well, uh, getting back to the long run view, uh, in the long run, I would say, and I will talk from political perspective, geopolitical perspective, uh, Brexit has a had a lot of myth in that, uh, coming from a lot of myth, and as I mentioned, it's uh, what was going on conser in Conservative Party. What I see in the long run that the, uh, they will try, that the United Kingdom will try to do a de good deal with the United States, and they will not come up with a good deal. They will try uh, the Canada, but will be this market will be too small, and the uh, people who live the uh, market will be too small. They will try the Commonwealth, and they will see that this is the not market. This is not the market they can relate to, and in the end, they will they will see that the best deal they can have is the. European Union as it was. And they, we will come back to square one, you know, like going from what we had, all this, all this fuzz and all these big deals that we have, we will see that the best deals we could have is what we have earlier. This is, will be the biggest paradox. And in the end of the day, we will have some, I am absolutely sure, some new deals between a European Union and United Kingdom that will be more or less the same that when the United Kingdom was in the European Union. This is, will be the biggest paradox of, you know, of the next century as we'll see. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Peter? Um, thank you. I, I, I think it's sort of what I said before. I, I think see the opportunity, see a, a new benchmarking partner and uh, build a new friendship because we need to build a new relationship. Um, we need the UK, the UK needs us. Great, great observation. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Egan, uh, Short observation, Brexit is a disruption and disruption means opportunities. If you don't have issues and difficulties, you don't have a profit margin. So do, don't, don't look at the issues, look at the opportunities when it comes to Brexit. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much once again uh, to all participants, uh, Mate, Peter, Egente, thank you very much. I think this was really interesting and thank you for those who joined us both on the Zoom and on social media. Uh, so uh, let's, let's see, let's wait for next events when we can discuss further what, uh, where is this developing and uh, uh, really it's, it's a really interesting time and I guess now with COVID, hopefully fading away uh, now we will have more and more uh, time and attention to, to spend on the consequences of, of Brexit on, on Europe and Lithuania and, and on Britain. Uh, thank you very much uh, and see you in the next uh, webinars. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Bye.